हरिक सर स्टार्ट कीजिए लाइव हो चुका है प्रोग्राम पनिक सर प्रोग्राम को स्टार्ट कर दे लाइव हो चुका है प्रोग्राम ओके गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल दिस ईयर एज यू नो दिस ईयर वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव सेवेंटी फिफ्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ इंडियन इंडिपेंडेंस ऑन दिस स्टेज वी आर ऑल्सो ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस सेकेंड ईयर एज वी स्टार्टेड लास्ट ईयर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी This year, second year, India International Saravai Student Scientist Award for Childrens, and uh, this uh, phase uh, registration and completion phase has been over for first round. And so for second round, we will select some thirty people, thirty students for this award purpose. We have already declared their scores and all the things. And today we are uh, on conducting one. grand celebration webinar with uh, specially designated some peoples who are the pride of our india and all the globe also first of all we are introducing our uh, inaugurator today we have with us from bangalore uh, prallad ramarao sir sir has been awarded and rewarded with padma shri award by the government of india and sir has a great experience in specially in the field of missile launching and missile design sir has worked and served the whole nation from drdo and uh, sir also have an experience of working with dr pg abdul kalam the renowned and our beloved scientist president of india former president of india so sir welcome sir today we have with us prallad ramarao sir padma shri awarded thank you namaskar thank you sir uh, next uh, we have with us uh, today's most important guest uh, our respected and most beloved person uh, dr jayant joshi sir who is a scientist from and sub for almost three decades in isro and uh, it's it's our pride moment that we are uh, interacting with a scientist who is a team member of mission mangal mission mars mission mom uh, a, a prestigious mission of isro also so sir welcome sir uh, please stay with us not the least but uh, we also have with us uh, our respected chairman sir dr chakramuli joshi ji by whom uh, we, he is also is on travels uh, from uh, um, uh, maharashtra to his gujarat sir welcome sir sir with your valid permission we are starting this program today and uh, as you know all know sir is busy with a very prestigious and very uh, proud uh, organized uh, our one ramanujan amrit bharat yatra we are uh, conducted this on behalf of all india ramanujan math club and in this course of uh, yatra it has which has been started 2nd october mahatma gandhi's birthday and uh, from rajkot somnath temple it already traveled towards jammu kashmir and from jammu kashmir towards maharashtra so from uh, now today started his uh, journey from maharashtra to his own place and it will be uh, completed this yatra will be completed at agartala the capital of tripura on 22nd december which is the national mathematics day and day uh, birth day of from so it will come uh, one by one all the places of all the uh, places of uh, each and every state uh, out of 20 um, uh, our 28 state 25 states will be covered by this yatra so sir is busy with that one today we also welcome our uh, sandeep patil ji who is a who are uh, the uh, national secretary of national council of teachers and is the largest uh, government of india accredited uh, vigyan prasar webnet accredited uh, forum of teachers as well as scientist also so welcome sir and one uh, more information that uh, 
uh, in this program after a some uh, while uh, nasa people will join especially george a seliger who is a uh, scientist uh, basically a system scientist uh, at isro uh, sorry at nasa johnson space center jsc so he will address about the uh, road to mars about all the things what had been done by uh, nasa and uh, he will also compare with isro's success also so it will be a uh, better learning for us so please join us uh, for a while by this time uh, i am sharing Uh, it's a time of inauguration, virtual inauguration. Our today's inaugurator is uh, Padma Sri Pralad Ramaraudi. Sir, uh, please allow us to uh, start the slide of virtual inauguration with your valid permission, sir. Sir, uh, uh, unmute yourself, sir. Yeah, please proceed. Go ahead. I'm very happy. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay.
स्वामेव प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्म वदिष्या सत्यं वदिष्या Thank you, sir. Uh, now it's time uh, for inaugural address. Today we has uh, uh, we have with us uh, today's inaugurator, Dr. Pralhad Rama Rao, sir, Padma Shri Awardi. Sir, uh, it's our privilege to uh, it's our privilege that you are with us, sir. Please uh, <coughs> address us with your your words of wisdom. Okay, okay, Anjan Banik. Thank you very much. and uh, all the vips here who are all concerned and who are all dedicated to make india great make india scientific make take india to higher heights welcome to all of them plus i believe lots of students students are there and uh, i welcome all the students because they are the future of our country i welcome all the students and uh, today's uh, event uh, the being managed by anjan banik is a very significant thing see we are he has, he has made a slogan slogan is har ghar sara bhai har ghar kalam that means his dream his dream is every house will create will generate will evolve will uh, nurture one sara bhai Every house, one color. That is the dream. He has a dream that your house should generate a color, Mara Sara Bai. So, uh, fortunately, uh, I worked with both Sara Bai and Kalam, and I was there in 1981 uh, when uh, I no, 71, 71. I joined. Uh, I I I I I I I was there and I, I have seen Sarabhai coming to VSSC. and Kalam was there in DRDO. he also came so the, it is a very nice comparison to see how Sarabhai led the country in scientific research space research especially space research and also atomic research and how Kalam guided the country in uh, space technology missile technology defense technology and also nuclear technology so very important to compare how two great scientists great people have taken this country to great heights so there, there is one way of uh, we have to give uh, we res- respects to them how they have done and what impression they have made in the in the world in india and in the minds of the young people young children see uh, sarabhai from was from a very rich family and a very sophisticated person he got educated in best of the universities in the world he had a job profile which is uh, uh, actually anybody will be jealous oh my goodness what a job he has got what a recognition he has got he could uh, uh, take his telephone and call the prime minister of india prime minister will respond that is the type of a, a personality sarabhai uh, uh, had and uh, but at the same time though he had a personality of that great uh, nature he was a very simple man in real life so when he will come to He is a nice. Somebody is to switch off because a lot of noise is coming. So when he created uh, Vikram Sarabhai, he created 
not only space center he created the atomic center he created a new physics physical research laboratory so many things he created when he created he started a new way of looking at scientific institutions it should be very very cool it should have greenery you should have a, a, a sort of a ecosystem which will en enable people to do research fundamental research applied research scientific ethos should be there scientific feeling should be there so he he brought a new way of this, uh, creating a laboratory of that class so he was a great man and uh, even now we all see how vsc is located among amidst, amidst the nature natural surrounding he will not allow a single tree to be cut it should be there only but you grow more and more trees give and also he was a lover of arts you know many people know him only as a scientist he love used to love singing dance he is a great man so he is a multifaceted super speciality super human being also he had a sensitivity of a very high level high class this is one way one type of a scientist who can come from almost like you know heaven such a very great man and the way he created the uh, space research the way he created the, the atomic research is fantastic because both are now directly with the prime minister of india and both are progressing in the best along with the best of the world this is one one type of a personality whom we all respect sarabhai vikram sarabhai now you come to abdul kalam exactly opposite contrast he is not from a rich family he is from an ordinary family and he was also now having lot of financial problem economic stresses and he went to chennai he didn't go abroad for any foreign education he was not trained anywhere he was only educated in the mit at chennai and you know local local schools and uh, many people did not know such school can produce a president of president of the country or a top scientific advisor or principal scientific advisor for the government of india nobody thought a simple man simple you know and uh, how he shaped he shaped two three agencies he shaped one is the space research because he was the first project director of a technically complex system that is a satellite launch vehicle slv the concept of project director was evolved with kalam he was the first project director in india in the whole country the first project director and he represented what do you mean by project director what are his responsibilities his accomplishment his commitment how he will bring a team how he will meet the challenges that the team is facing so many things he evolved how do you find find solutions so any technical problem you want to do there are challenges how do you find a solution sometimes solution comes from industry sometimes solution come from academy sometimes solution come from within our own house our own scientists our own engineers sometimes solution will come from outside our scientific body may be other scientific body so he had the knack of seeing a problem how who can solve the problem he and in india he knew almost every industry every university every scientific body he knew kalam knew and he knew more to the people also not only the bodies he knew the people he knew people by name he used to know the people by name so this is his style of functioning is totally different from the style of functioning of vikram sarabhai but both achieved their goals both achieved one was a very sophisticated scientist another was a down to earth jo bolte hai na that is a, he is a son of the soil type he used to talk to local people and solve the problem whereas vikram sarabhai he had a international global connection to solve the problem so they are two different people and we are saying especially anjan banik is telling har ghar sarabhai har ghar kalam that means you choose you want to be sarabhai you want to be kalam both will take you to success 
both will find solutions for you you don't have to be super rich man from a royal family you can be ordinary man still you can hit a big success that is a message i got that is if you are committed to your goal you can do anything so that way i have a lot of respect for both the souls great souls and one more thing because today i see a lot of students i believe some nearly 100 students are participating in this uh, uh, in this today's seminar webinar and uh, i want to tell how dr kalam used to attract the young students attract the young students and uh, he was uh, he, had, he had a charm he had a method of uh, 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 talking to the young boys and young girls and then not he will vibe you know he has a vibration which will be uh, very much liked by everybody you know politicians like him students like him mothers like him grandmothers like him pujaris like him swami ji is like him ministers like him lawyers like him doctors like him see how he is able to uh, establish a link with human beings so i have seen him because i worked for closely nearly 30 years with kalam from the from he came to dr he was a simple scientist to become director of a laboratory then he became a super director then he became a uh, scientific advisor then he became uh, principal scientific advisor then he finally became president of india all the roles i have seen him he is a, how he has converted people how he has changed the indian industry how he has made the uh, academic institutions deliver goods and there are many examples each how he has done i have worked with him and if you give a chance i will talk about kalam for hours each aspect i can give hours but this is not the time but i want to welcome all the people the top scientists professionals who are participate today and also managing today's function and all the children who want to know how to become kalam or how to become sarabhai i is a challenge you should be and i want to tell all the students each one of you can become a sarabhai or a kalam you don't have to worry you don't have doubt can i become or i will not become no you be 100% sure that god has given you enough capabilities if you are to only decide yes one day i will be like kalam you decide and after 10 years you are you are like kalam so you have to decide that once you take it the oath you take a oath on azadi ka amrit mahotsav you take a oath that i will become one day kalam that's all then you will get so i want to wish all the students i thank you um, mr 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 i want to thank anjan bonik uh, for uh, giving me opportunity to share my views i also thank thank jayant joshi and chandra uh, chairman and secretary everybody for giving me opportunity and i am sure especially this is coming from a relatively smaller place like uh, tripura and agartala see everybody knows mumbai delhi hyderabad but calcutta but less people know agartala and tripura i am happy because i was there in agartala so wonderful place i enjoyed every hour i was in agartala and i have lot of respect for tripura tripura government tripura polity ministers tripura bureaucracy i met everybody and i was very happy that a small state and a small team is doing such a wonderful work for the nation i congratulate banu banik and his team i also thank all the people who have come to share their views especially jayant uh, everybody thank you very much i wish this function this webinar a big success it will go a long way thank you very much jai hind thank you sir thank you for your words of wisdom and blessings also sir sir keep your blessing always with us and once again uh, sir if possible please uh, once again you please come sir agartala because there is a grand ceremony in uh, on 22nd december uh, we are celebrating on behalf of this organization 
uh, we are celebrating the valedictory ceremony of Ramanuja and Amrit Bharat, Ganesh Jatra, as well as uh, the, we are celebrating the Amrit Mahotsav National Mathematics Day. So if possible, sir, uh, because uh, flight is there from Bangalore, it's just a few minutes or few hours. Uh, so <laughs> fine, sir. <laughs> Once again. I, uh, Anjan, I was also told that you are going to inaugurate your science uh, museum in December. Your minister was telling, minister and the principal secretary informed me that they are planning to inaugurate the science museum in December. If that is coinciding, I think I will definitely come. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Check, sure, with sure. The, check with the government. Uh, Deputy Chief Minister told me that December we are inaugurating the Science uh, Museum. Please come. Science Center or Science Museum, whatever it's called, for your uh, uh, Agartala. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, oh, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Your message uh, with your reference uh, to uh, him. And if possible, it will be uh, done, sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are forwarding um, um, that. Uh, today, we, it's our, another privilege that we have uh, one person uh, because we are uh, talking about road to Mars and there is a, a perspective from ISRO also and uh, we have a pride that we also put our sign on the Mars. So uh, today we have uh, Dr. Jayant Joshi directly. He was not only serving the ISRO or the nation uh, as a ISRO person uh, for three decades. He also directly involved with this Mission Mangal. So uh, it, it is, it's our privilege that we are getting him. Uh, sir, please uh, detail what your, uh, you have experienced and share, sir, and uh, uh, give a uh, valid pathway, give a lesson to us so that our students who, uh, to whom we are going to be uh, conferred the student scientist award, they may uh, be uh, a scientist in the days coming, sir. So, sir, it's our privilege. Sir, please uh, start your uh, presentation. Sir, Jayant Joshi from ISRO. Unmute yourself, sir. Okay, am I audible now? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, so very good evening to one and all. Um, my Pranam and Namaskar to Padma Shri Prahlad Ramarao, sir, Dr. Chandra Moli Joshi, sir, Anjan Banikji, Sandeep Patil, and all other dignitaries and my dear students. Uh, it's a great opportunity to interact uh, uh, with all you students, especially in presence of uh, legendary person like uh, Ramarao ji. Uh, when he speaks, there is hardly anything left for me to tell because the stature of work that he would have uh, done in those times, you know, would be unparalleled. But still, uh, there are a few things uh, which I had, uh, I was fortunate to uh, be associated with uh, Mars mission. I would definitely like to share my uh, experience in uh, a brief because time is short and we have to also listen to uh, NASA engineer for this uh, same topic. So as uh, uh, Rama Rauji told that, yes, we had two legends, uh, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai and uh, uh, Abdul Kalam ji. Uh, both were very truly said they were distinct, uh, you know, in their nature and uh, Sarabhai had a nature because he uh, he actually we can uh, call him that in the time of early 60s he had a dream that if a country like India has to prosper and if I want to uh, really develop my country then space technology is the only tool which is a viable solution for a all round growth for my country uh, so. And uh, he started, uh, India did not started its, sorry, ISRO did not started its program with making satellite or making rocket. But instead, he first thought that people of India or my government or people should know that how to use that gadget, space gadget, that is satellite. So a first uh, internationally famous uh, mission was launched that is called 
site, satellite instructional television experiment, and ATS-6 was the satellite from USA, which was taken on rent for one year to be moved from uh, American, uh, uh, you know, space, uh, uh, this thing, uh, parking slot to our India for one year. And he demonstrated how effectively a satellite can be used for social uh, development tool, also for an educational development tool. And what he did was that later part, they start making a sounding rocket and th near th that is Thumba near uh, currently the place is called Vikram Sarabhai Space uh, Center VSSC. So a small fishing village near VSSC that is called Thumba. And uh, from there the program started. But see the beauty, the sounding rocket, the first sounding rocket which uh, was launched from the soil of Thumba was not made by us. He got this rocket from USA. He got fuel from some other country like uh, France. He got some computers from Germany. Then he got engineers to work on and to have day-to-day -day mission uh, analysis and system engineering from Japan. So he integrated the entire, uh, you know, at that time, the so-called a bit familiar nations with the space technology. So they integrate everything and he, he declared that Thumba would be the place from where the sounding rocket uh, project would start. So things started. So what, what he did, so this, you see his vision, like Rama Rauji was telling, he was an internationally famous person. He used his influence in integrating the people all around the world and took advantage. Hello? Am I audible still? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Fine. fine. Sorry. And he took advantage of his nature and uh, he integrated everybody at uh, Thumba. So what we did got, he built a small team of young engineers and told them we need to learn from these people. And at that time, Indira Gandhi declared Thumba as a global village, right? It was declared as a global village. The advantage what we got was because entry to India and especially people or the engineers or scientists all around who wanted to have some study or experiment uh, related to aeronomy. So aeronomy is study of a, a science of an upper atmosphere. Whosoever want to do study need to do aeronomy. So aeronomy for that you need to have the sounding rocket because the reason why the sounding rocket were used because the height or the altitude at which the aeronomy is being conducted or experimented, neither it is too high where you can put a satellite, nor it is too low where you can get work from a balloon. So it is an in-between thing. So that was that is why the sounding rocket were required. And this young team, which he uh, has made, he told that we need to learn from these people, right? So people and scientists from all around the world came to Thumba. They started this experiment, and we started. This is how it began. That was the vision of Sarabhai. He told that today I do not want that we will immediately make. Uh, sounding rocket or satellites or we will immediately make the launch vehicle but definitely after 20 30 years we will be in definitely in this business and today we are able to see that whatever we had it is falling short all of our facilities now we need more launch pad we need more launch vehicle we we need more and more satellites we have already launched 110 satellites by now right and out of that you can see the wonders which we did, not only by doing this uh, uh, communication satellite, then we had uh, remote sensing satellite, we had uh, navigation satellite, and one important uh, R of the satellite was the uh, scientific mission, or sometimes we call interplanetary mission, right? So the interplanetary one of the, the two internationally famous uh, mission which ISRO did was Chandrayaan and Mangalyaan. That is Mangalyaan, Mars Orbiter Mission MOM, and Chandrayaan. Chandrayaan was launched in 2008, and we were the first country right, uh, that we did it successfully. Uh, uh, we did that successfully, and we were the first to provide the data 
to the world the presence of water on the surface of moon that was our achievement through chandrayaan 1 and then later on 5th of november 2013 we launched mars orbiter mission that is mom right so after a gap of nearly 5 years but we were not sitting silent you know internationally whenever uh, students we need to learn something that whenever there are some complex and critical mission though there is a rule and there is an understanding between all space faring nations that definitely they do exchange the information or the know how they provide their analysis to uh, to each other so that because it's a very costly uh, business you know space business is very costly uh, to know it how costly it is i would put it in a simple way that 1 kg of weight if you want to put it into space the cost is roughly 15 to 20000 dollars per kg so that is the kind of cost so that is the reason that people used to interact with each other and they give information but when we decided that the isro was given a mandate to conduct mars orbiter mission we did have hardly any such internationally exchanged information everything was new what we what we had the information was all from the books which we read or the information which was available in the open domain posted by the different countries that's all there was no criticality there is no uh, specific design or some critical issues which were told to us but we were told that we have to do this mission and one thing we need to understand that the opportunity which we get every opportunity when you want to go to mars occurs every 26 month so after 26 month only you get an another opportunity simple reason is that at that time because you know the in the solar system you know the uh, motion of the all the planets right so uh, every 26 month there comes a time where the distance between earth and mars is minimum and naturally that is the time when we should try to launch our uh, uh, mission because at that time if the distance is shortest uh at the minimum cost of fuel or at the uh, using minimum fuel with the minimum energy and minimum time we can reach to that particular planet so out of 26 month students when we were given an order or clear mandate from the headquarter that yes we need to do this mission because 2020 uh, to uh, 2014 then 2016 and 2018 these were the uh, these were the dates Uh, we uh, years which were available for that opportunity to occur so 2004 14 two months earlier that becomes november 13 and that was the date uh, chosen actually that uh, date was uh, uh, one week ahead the actual uh, was some 28th of october 9 2013 but because one of the uh, telemetry and uh, telecommand uh, special ship which was to be stationed in the sea because of very bad weather it could not reach that destination Uh, the then chairman uh, radha krishnan ji uh, declared that uh, the mission would be delayed by uh, by a week or so so then the 5th november was the date uh, 2013 for the launch day and uh, pslv uh, xl was the rocket chosen uh, initially the rocket chosen was gslv but because of some initial problems in the engines of the earlier flights of gslv we decided that we will not take a risk of launching the our maiden flight to mars using gslv so we have chosen pslv that is polar satellite launch vehicle c25 was the series the, the name of that mission pslv c25 on the 5th november 2013 we had taken that particular mission Now the total weight of the particular satellite that payload was 1337 kg that is 1337 kg and initial design life what we had estimated or what we had planned was hardly 6 month we thought that okay even if we our mission that is our mom if it survives for 6 month definitely our mission is accomplished but 
to utter surprise and to have a proud moment for all of us the maneuvering of mom was done so precisely and so perfectly using minimum of fuel living enough fuel inside the fuel tank of a spacecraft that the mom is still today working even after 7 years and few months right so that is what the complexity is and that is how it is acclaimed as the internationally famous uh, mission it is not that because we were not the first to do the mars mission but definitely we were first who had done this feat on its maiden attempt you would be definitely you would be knowing that there are many countries who tried initially uh, before us but many more than 50% of the spacecraft were lost between the transition of that particular orbit that is from earth ground orbit to heliocentric orbit when the transition takes place there itself many of the satellites were lost so you have to be very careful and very precise in launching the uh, this particular mission so now what happened when we were given the time that we had to do the mission hardly 15 months were left because if that 15 months also have elapsed then we would have to wait for another 26 month we had no time now can you think whenever you are doing a new mission whether it is a new satellite new launch vehicle or a new mission if it is for the first time generally the time consumed is about 2 to 2 and 1/2 years because roughly one year goes into making of those things because they are for the very first time you do uh, so many kind of models first you do the breadboarding that is called laboratory model then you call then you make an engineering model then you uh, make an environmentally capable uh, model then you subject it to various testing in the environment where that particular spacecraft has to survive right so martian was the atmosphere where we had to put our satellite we have to be very careful because we did not have enough data because we are doing it for the first time and the other countries who had already did it they did not give us the enough kind of data so this was the this was the great challenges we had we were facing at the time and because we did not have if we start ordering the different kind of things which were not available in in india at the time it would again take its own time to arrive and we would definitely miss the bus so we decided that whatever component which are likely to go inside the mars orbiter mission spacecraft the sum of or majority of the instrument or the component or the substation which were available from the previous mission were upgraded they were refurbished right and they were tested for the martian environment we did it within the record time of 15 months including the testing again i go back and recall you about the two years or two and a half years of time one year we been making of the sub system or space lab and dear student one and half to one one to one and half year only for testing 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 and testing this is the kind of testing because you can't do anything once you go to that particular place once you are in space nothing is in your hand so you have to ensure that the things whatever you make whatever you send into space has to be of highest reliability so how to design how to uh, how to achieve the reliability not only in selection of component but uh, perfect mission planning timing everything but unless you have very rugged test plan particularly the test plan in a environment where the martian environment was created on ground the kind of vacuum the kind of temperature variation which we anticipated on the mars we have simulated here the entire spacecraft was put in a very big chamber and it was tested for one full month you were you were saying something yes no sir uh, sir uh, george seliger from nasa already joined with us sir so uh, thanks for joining sir hello yes yes patil sir put him uh, as a co-host sir george seliger George, are uh, I may, may I audible to you, sir? George, may I audible to you, sir? Hello. Coast banana, Banik sir, unko coast banana diye. Okay, 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 okay. 
What, sir? Uh, we have um, uh, our admin has already made you the co-host. So please uh, unmute yourself. Hello. 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 Sir, continue, sir. Okay. And uh, by the way, uh, Anjanji, how much time is there for me? I can, uh, you know. Okay, okay. No, no matter, sir. No issue, no issue. Please. Fine, fine, fine. Thank you. I will not take much time because. Uh, yeah, 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 I know, I know. Yeah. Some of the important things I want to, uh, you know, let the students. Sure, sure, uh, sure, 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 sure. Okay, sir. so this, uh, dear students, these were the, uh, and uh, Banikji, whenever you feel that, okay, now you had, uh, your time has come to switch over to our uh, main guest speaker, you can always tell me. In between. No, 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 no matter, no matter, sir, please, please, please carry on. Thank you, thank you. So these were the challenges that uh, we had to test our spacecraft in uh, that particular Martian environment. So this was tested and uh, then uh, we were ready. Now here, student, we need to learn, we need to remember one thing that whenever we want to go from Earth to an, another planetary body, we need to put this orbiter, uh, which was there, there, around Sun also. It is not just only around Earth that when you launch it, it is not enough. Like other satellite, we, we, they move in the earthbound orbit, right? So that is okay. But at some point of time, because you have to leave the earth gravitational field and you have to go to Mars, right? So these are the relative motions of the different planet within our solar system, which we need to understand. We need to practice, we need to fully understand, calculate everything and do the mission. So the uh, entire mission, the main objective was that design, right? To have a mission management and planning of an interplanetary mission because we are doing it for the first time. Whether we are able to do it, whether we, we are able to reach there, that were the main objective, right? And which we did it very successfully on our uh, maiden attempt. Now, uh, think of a situation, uh, Manikji, can we have that uh, profile slide which I sent you? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, uh, you can see, uh, this is just a uh, small uh, uh, diagram, uh, which I just wanted to share with you. And you can see, uh, initially, uh, uh, Earth where the Earth is at the 5th of November 13 on the, you can see just uh, right side above the sun in the center, you can see along with some green elliptical orbits uh, I have shown, right? So Earth, uh, the uh, place of Earth where it is on the 5th November 13 from uh, where we launched our Mars Orbiter mission. So initially these green elliptical orbits, these are called Earth-bound orbits because we had selected the most fuel efficient technique of orbit transfer. We did not go because we did not have GSLV. Even GSLV cannot take you directly to Mars because then you need a very giant, very powerful and gallons and gallons and uh, liters of uh, propellant to use. We cannot, uh, we could, uh, we did not afford it. So what we did, as I told you, we did not have GSLV. We had PSLV. PSLV had another limitation that it cannot carry more weight than uh, for what it is designed for. So you see, whenever the launch mass is less than 2000 or nearly 1800 kg, uh, PSLV is very good. And here you can see the launch mass. I already told you that was 1337 kg. So this was a perfect choice, right? But then what happens that this particular uh, PSLV, which was launched, then initially uh, uh, we have to take it to a different orbit. So what we do is, whenever you throw the, you inject a satellite, right, in a particular first earthbound orbit, it goes into an elliptical orbit. 
will not discuss the orbit dynamics uh, in this uh, today's talk it takes a little longer but you place a, or inject the satellite from your launch vehicle in such a way that it acquires an initial elliptical orbit so that one is the first innermost green orbit which it occupies so you can see this ellipse as 2.1 is the nearest to the earth that is on the top side of the earth where you can see you can see that every uh, every orbit has coincided in that particular point uh, on the top side of the earth and on the lower side of the earth you can see there are different uh, ellipses where the point are different that is called apogee points right so the farthest point from the earth center is apogee and the nearest one is called the perigee now suppose on the innermost green orbit we are not doing anything right then the satellite would go on circling around that orbit only it will not go anywhere but what we do is when it comes to that perigee point that is the top uh, side that is near uh, the uh, nearest point uh, of that particular earth right then at that point we will fire and liquid apogee motor which is inside a mars orbiter mission spacecraft it will produce an delta v that is an extra thrust so instead of going again into the same orbit you will end up in an lead again a bigger elliptical orbit so slowly at every perigee firing you can increase your apg and your elliptical orbit becomes larger larger and larger so this is the way you can see there are number of green initial orbit around earth but you are not supposed to be we are not supposed to be confined within those earth bound orbit because the, we this we did it to slowly raise the orbit before we really enter into heliocentric orbit because if you really want to go to mars then what we have to do is we have to take this spacecraft around sun also right so at one particular moment when you and when you uh, gather an enough momentum then at that time the burn of an engine that of an uh, mars orbiter mission space shuttle it done in such a way that you acquire such a speed that then you enter into an heliocentric orbit that is your uh, spacecraft now also moves around sun so now you have got two particular this thing one is our spacecraft is also moving around sun right and we all know that orbits are almost always elliptical so there is one ellipse now second ellipse where you are you can see on the farthest left side top you can see that uh, position of mars at the time of 5th of november 13 it is written so mars planet was there right now that is also moving in that particular uh, uh, red red color orbit that is also elliptical and that is also moving around sun now we have got two ellipses right one is our mars orbiter mission that particular uh, the raised orbit and another orbit which is uh, uh, taken by the uh, mars planet now this would intersect at one particular point and that is the point where we must ensure that at that particular point time and place our mars orbiter spacecraft must arrive precisely at that particular location otherwise we will not be able to catch we will not be able to catch the mars and we would definitely miss uh, this mars orbiter mission now uh, the very important point which i wanted to tell is that uh, we must know that uh, what is the margin uh, 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 how much margin we have uh, 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 we have got to reach particular that point now we know that the distance to mars is roughly 66000 crores kilometer right and now imagine that 66 crores of kilometer far from earth there is one box which is put in deep space away that is 66000 kilometer away from earth and that box dimension is 50 kilometer cube ha yahan se 66 करोड़ किलोमीटर दूर पे एक बक्सा रखा है और आपको एक गोल्फ का बॉल है दैट यू हैव टू हिट दैट गोल्फ बॉल फ्रॉम द अर्थ इन सच ए वे दैट प्रिसाइसली एट दैट मोमेंट वेयर द मास इज वेरी नियर बाय और ऑलमोस्ट टू दैट पॉइंट आपका गोल्फ का बॉल भी उसी डब्बे में उसी समय गिरना चाहिए दैट इज दाइंड ऑफ एक्सी नीडेड सो वॉट वुड यू गेट you would get 50 divided by 66 km that is the kind of error which is permitted 
now you see the kind of accuracy which is needed and what happens that if we cannot put our so i have to back calculate i know what is the speed of mars that is roughly 24 km per second right so i know i have to back calculate that what uh, because i know the initial uh, place of the mars where it was uh, when uh, when i launched my satellite right so uh, if it is running at a speed of 24 km per second how much time it would take that mars planet would take to reach to that particular intersection point now i have to back calculate now if i want my spacecraft to reach to that particular intersection point of two ellipses how much time is required for my satellite because i know at what speed my satellite would be running so how many days it would take to reach from where it is launched and how much time it is left that is back calculation which we did and precisely the another point is because when you have to leave the earth gravitational field we should have an escape velocity which is much higher that we 11 point roughly 11 to 11.2 km per second now your space craft once goes into that particular orbit or in that particular which is traveling towards uh, mars then everything is switched off all your system only your telemetry and some of the data you are receiving uh, all your engines are shut off because it is a travel of 300 days so after 300 days because it has to cover a distance of 66 crore kilometer so at that after traveling 300 days you would be almost near to martian orbit now at that point of time if we are not able to slow down our space craft listen to this very carefully because the speed is so high that if we do not attempt anything we do not give any command this satellite definitely it will become a fly by mission It, it will simply say bye bye to mars and it will go into deep space we will not be able to and our mission would fail so you have to ensure that how much time before that particular point of intersection you have to sufficiently slow down your space craft to aapko kitna slow down karna hai you have to aapko itna slow down karna padega ki jab wo martian orbit ke nazdik pahunche tab मार्टियन मार्स का जो ग्रेविटेशनल फोर्स है वो उसको कैप्चर कर ले अगर उसकी स्पीड ज्यादा है तो वह कैप्चर नहीं कर पाएगा बिकॉज वी ऑलवेज नो किसी भी प्लेनेट के आसपास एनी सेटेलाइट इफ इट विट वॉन्ट्स टू ऑर्बिट एनी पर्टिकुलर प्लेनेट देर आर ऑन बैलेंसिंग ऑफ ऑनली टू परफ्यूज टू फोर्सेज वन इज देंट्रीफ्यूगल अनदर इज देंट्रीपीटल सेंट्रीफ्यूगल फोर्स इज दन विच इज because of the gravitational force of that particular planet now we are talking about mars so whatever mars has gravity it will try to pull the particular satellite towards the center of mars and if we do not want to fall and if we want our mars orbiter to orbit around mars then we need to generate a sufficient tangential velocity so that it creates a centripetal force which is equal to centrifugal force and your satellite could start orbiting around mars that is exactly what we did but there is a problem problem was that uh, uh, we knew that exactly at what point of time we should start deboosting that is our we need to slow our speed now remember the one thing i told you that all the system and engines were shut off right in my uh, it was it was traveling in a deep space it was going it was going far away far away far away it was almost near to martian atmosphere and everything was shut off and we had to give a command to our spacecraft so that our engine can be turned on right engine should get turned on it should uh, it should fire and at the same time we had to flip the hundred space craft by 180 degree because you know when it is traveling towards mars the nozzle of the space craft engine is towards the other side because then only according to newton's third law you will be getting the thrust in the opposite direction right so that means what could happen is that we precisely did it in such a way that we had flipped the satellite and we have given this command from earth and our engine which were sleeping for 300 days accepted that command and our engine got that command they got fired and because now it is flipped and the nozzle is towards mars 
and the thrust the uh, escaping th gases from the uh, engine is towards mars so thrust is towards opposite to mars direction that means initially it was the speed was uh, the it was traveling towards mars now it is flipped so now it would try to travel or it will generate a thrust opposite to mars so that means your speed would be becomes a little slower so that way we sufficiently slow down our spacecraft in such a way that we actually reach that particular point of intersection it got captured into martian atmosphere and that was if we had missed that particular point we did not have any experience right and one more thing it would take 21 minutes to reach your command so these were the count, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know challenges we had taken and we amaze the world that by our maiden attempt we reached to mars we took so many uh, photographs you would which are you would have definitely seen in a public and open domain as well as our isro website so well, there are many things and uh, thank you students for taking me, giving me some time to interact with some of the exciting wanted in complexity this mission has and how we did it precisely and perfectly with the lowest possible cost right that is 450 crores of rupees that is also the reason that is we will not discuss here but that was why it mai sirf itna hi kahunga ki duniya pslv ek aur mars mission ne aisa ek chakkar kar diya hai ki humne abhi tak pslv se अपने देश से ज्यादा फॉरेन सैटेलाइट को ज्यादा लॉन्च किया है वो इसलिए लोग हमारे पास नहीं आते हैं क्योंकि हम सस्ता करते हैं वो इसलिए आते हैं कि हम बहुत अच्छा करते हैं सो विद दिस वर्ड्स आई विश ईच एंड एवरी स्टूडेंट ए ब्राइट एंड वेरी गुड कैरियर इन देयर लाइफ थैंक यू वेरी मच मनिक जी फॉर गिविंग मी सम टाइम टू इंटरेक्ट विद स्टूडेंट थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू सर फॉर योर very uh, deep uh, thoughts uh, full speech thank you sir please um, uh, be with us for few moments we need your kind assistance sir uh aaj bahut hi today is very precious for my life for your life and who are the would be to scientist uh, nowadays student scientist all of your life because today uh, this is a meeting where uh, from not only isro not only drdo scientist are there also there is a one very um, renowned person he is nothing uh, none but other than none other than our george seliger George Seliger, uh, he is a scientist at NASA, and at uh, uh, he is working from um, um, it, it is it is in, from nineteen eighty three. He is working with, with NASA, and now he is posted at uh, John, JSC Johnson Space Center. and uh, it's, it's our pride that uh, in this amrit azadi ka amrit mahotsav when whole the nation of india is um, celebrating the 75th year of its independence and throughout the year and at that moment when we are also uh, uh, doing organizing such a prestigious webinar on behalf of second uh, year india international saravai student scientist award in first award ceremony also he, he sent us a message and joined us this time he is taking a session also so sir welcome sir first of all uh, uh, sir i am introducing some of our dignitaries we have with us sir uh, our very beloved uh, scientist and team member of mangal mission of isro uh, our our jayant joshi sir He is a uh, team member scientist of 
ISRO and um, um, uh, uh, for a three decades is serving at ISRO in various, he led in French Guiana also for um, uh, launch of various satellites and launch vehicle. Today he is with us. Along with him, today uh, another person with us, he is Prahlad Ramarao, sir, he is working uh, at DRDO with uh, uh, renowned president of India, former president of India and great scientist APJ Abdul Kalam G also at DRDO and uh, beside, behind this Agni and uh, Prithi missiles, he have a very great contribution, sir. And along with us, today we have with us uh, Dr. Chandramoli Joshi Ji, who is the main chairperson of this uh, total webinar and total organization, we have with us uh, our national secretary, Sandeep Patil ji also from Maharashtra, Mumbai, and other dignitaries also with us. And in the presence of all of them, first of all, we are uh, today we are uh, conferring some award to uh, George Selager. Uh, this is the and. Uh, We hope Jan Joshi sir will be is, is here to declare this award for George Seleja sir. I am sharing the screen. Joshi sir, very nice and very effective and interesting lecture. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chandra Mori sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very nice, very interesting, sir. Sir, you are to want to start your uh, presentation, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, whenever, whenever you're ready. Uh, I just want to make sure that y'all can see the the presentation. Sir, first we 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 want to share your uh, award, sir. Then uh, you please share the uh, session, sir. Take your session, please. May I stop, sir? Your uh, uh, sharing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And somebody has a conferring some award to honor and we are also getting a feeling honored to honor him engineer george selager from jsc nasa usa i would like to request uh, our isro scientist and team member of uh, mangal mission of isro dr jain joshi sir to declare this award uh, dr bikram sarabhai memorial india international azadika amrit mahotsav scientist award 2021 to him. Sir, please. Okay, I feel extremely happy and uh, honored to confer Dr. Vikram Sir Memorial India International Amrit Mahatsav Scientist Award 2021 to George S. Salza of JSC NASA. Congratulations, George. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting our award. And, sir, please go ahead with your uh, presentation, sir. Once again, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So I'm getting ready to share my screen, hopefully. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. And uh, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Make it a full screen, sir. Okay. 
How about now? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, we're good. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Thank you for the award. I'm, I'm most honored uh, to have received it. And so today I will share with you the road to Mars. And unfortunately, there's not enough time to talk a lot about uh, a lot of the aspects of uh, going to Mars, but I'm going to kind of give you a highlight, uh, starting with a um, kind of a uh, uh, brief history of human spaceflight. You notice uh, the background there is uh, <laughs> uh, Star Trek, which I grew up in. And one of the reasons I put that there, and because I'm presenting to India, is because, uh, you know, we're starting to become an international uh, space uh, organization. Uh, uh, en uh, entity, if you will. Different companies or different uh, nations are coming together, you know, to help explore space. So one day, you know, we're going to have something like the Starship Enterprise, and uh, we're going to have a, a, a crew made up of people from different parts of the world. And uh, it, it's very exciting. Uh, maybe we'll have Balkans if we can find Balkan islands and <laughs> Balkan uh, 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 planets. Uh, but uh, in addition to the brief history of human space flight, I'm going to talk about the planned uh, roadmap to Mars, again, very high level. The challenges, and there's a whole bunch, but I'm going to uh, uh, touch on them. And then uh, the conclusion. So let's start with uh, the brief history of human space flight. And uh, for human space flight, it started uh, with the Mercury program uh, here in the United States. Uh, those are the seven uh, Mercury astronauts. They were all uh, Air Force uh, pilots. They were fighter pilots, and uh, they were people with high, you know, took high risk. Uh, that's one of the reasons they chose uh, those kind of astronauts back then, uh, was because uh, we we didn't know a lot about uh, uh, space flight and human rating uh, spacecrafts. Uh, you know, the 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 Redstone uh, rocket that launched Alan Shepard for the first time. Uh, was really a rocket for missiles. It wasn't intended for launching people, but missiles. And so um, there was a great deal of trying to understand what it's going to take uh, to make uh, something that used to launch missiles safe uh, for humans. Then we went on to, uh, and of course, uh, before I forget, the Mercury program, the purpose of it was to uh, understand if humans could live and work in space. Uh, you know, there was uh, concerns that Humans could not eat in space; that the food would come up their, <laughs> up uh, up their stomach and uh, uh, choke on their food, and there was uh, a lot of things that they didn't know. And so, the uh, space program first wanted to understand if you know humans could live and work in space. And once we began to understand, yeah, we can we can go up there. Then we uh, became the Merc uh, uh, rather the Gemini program. So now the Gemini program was a very pivotal point uh, in human spaceflight because we were going to have to learn how to rendezvous and dock in space. And uh, that's very challenging. When you got a large mass tra traveling like 17,500 miles an hour and trying to dock uh, is not a very simple task, as Neil Armstrong um, found out on Gemini 10, where they docked with Athena and Athena started to cause the, uh, the spacecraft and the uh, docking module to start to spin. And it was spinning out of control. And luckily, Neil Armstrong, uh, because he was a cool, calm, and collective person, uh, figured out how to keep the, uh, the, 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 uh, the spacecrafts uh, that, that were joined together uh, from slowing, you know, to slow them down. And then eventually, he was able to detach and, uh, and move away from the uh, Athena uh, 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 docking uh, station. But overall, it was a successful mission. And then we went on, uh, you know, because of the Gemini program, we went on to the Apollo space program, which uh, uh, took people to the moon. Uh, there you see, uh, you know, astronaut jumping up and down. That was the only way, the easiest way for them to get around because of the 400 pound suit that they wore. And then, of course, the lunar lander, uh, which landed on the on the moon. Now, interesting enough, and I'll be talking a little bit about the Artemis program, surface of the moon. 
with the 12 astronauts that walked on the moon uh, was about three, 3.2 days. That was it, that, not much time. Uh, and, and now we're going back to the moon uh, to stay and to live and learn and operate on another planet. So uh, even though we went to the moon, we still don't really know how to live and work on another planet. Uh, and then, of course, the space shuttle program. That's what I started with uh, when I came to NASA. And the space shuttle was a remarkable vehicle for being such old technology. Uh, it, it launched like a rocket. It orbited like a satellite. And it came down to Earth like a uh, jet airplane. Uh, it had five computers, you know, to, uh, to uh, keep it stable. Um, because without the five computers, uh, we used to call the, uh, the space shuttle a, a, a flying rock. Uh, it, it was very unstable. Um, the other, uh, and of course, we started to stay longer into space. And um, uh, now that, let me just uh, say that Skylab uh, was our first space station before the space station we have right now. And, uh, you know, they only did about three or four missions, but uh, we stayed there a long time, uh, like uh, 90 days, the maximum. And so it was an opportunity to see how humans uh, operated uh, in the space environment. Um, one thing about Skylab was it, it reused a lot of uh, uh, Apollo uh, hardware. All right, so let's talk about our planned roadmap to Mars. And so we what you're looking at here, and let's see if I can uh, get a laser pointer. Uh, okay, so we're looking at three phases of uh, going to Mars. First is what we call Earth dependent. In other words, we're close to Earth, and like for example, uh, you know, space station right now is orbiting around the uh, uh, around the Earth, and uh, it's but it's very dependent on Earth uh, from the standpoint that we have over 200 people on the ground that are monitoring systems on space station. Space station is a quite a complex machine. It's got about 3,500 uh, sensors. Uh, it's got over 100 computers and different systems. And you know, just three or six astronauts on board space station cannot do all that by the, you know monitor all those systems by themselves. It's it's too much information. And so the ground systems, both mission control. Uh, here in the United States, as well as Russia, um, help monitor a lot of those systems uh, that, that are on space station. And of course, we've got the commercial crew program uh, also happening here, but it's all very close to Earth. Then, uh, hopefully in 2022, uh, we're going to do the launch of the space launch system, uh, the world's biggest rocket ever built. And it's going to uh, launch uh, the Orion spaceship. To the, uh, to the moon uh, without a crew. Uh, it's gonna be just a, a, a dress rehearsal, as we call it, uh, for the technology that's gonna be needed uh, for, a, uh, for the uh, uh, going to the moon. Now, when we get to the moon, we're, there's a lot of activities that are gonna be going on here. And this is what we call proving ground. Why do we call it the proving ground? Because this is gonna be the opportunity to live and learn uh, to operate on another planet. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll I have a, a couple of slides about that uh, later in my presentation. But the important thing here is that we need to live and learn how to operate on another planet for a long period of time, more than three days, <laughs> like we did on Apollo, before we can go on to Mars. Because once we go to Mars, now we become Earth independent. What does that mean? That means that we can no longer rely on mission control uh, to help fix problems in real time. If something goes wrong, uh, it takes almost uh, 40 minutes round trip time uh, in order to uh, get a response uh, from an emergency situation. And so the systems that go to Mars are gonna have to be uh, what we call autonomous uh, type systems, systems that um, understand what's going on and they try to fix the problem in real time. One of the big challenges, and, and this is something that I, I'm involved with uh, right now, is uh, the technology that's gonna be needed for a human spaceflight mission, especially computers, is gonna be quite challenging. Here on the ground, you know, we look about, uh, you know, we talk about uh, artificial intelligence and really we're gonna need something like artificial intelligence uh, for autonomous systems going to Mars. 
uh, graphics processing systems, you know, for graphical processing of information and displaying it uh, correctly to the astronauts is that that kind of technology, that kind of uh, computer technology is very high speed stuff. And uh, it just doesn't operate very well in deep space because of the radiation effects um, that uh, radiation does on electronics, uh, things like uh, upsetting memory, uh, sometimes even uh, causing catastrophic latch-ups of computer com uh, components. And so there's some, uh, there's many challenges associated with that. And I'll, I'll say a little more about that later in my presentation. But again, uh, it's, you know, earth dependent and then the proving ground and then earth independent uh, uh, going to Mars. And hopefully uh, within uh, this century, uh, we'll have humans on Mars and hopefully uh, uh, India will be part of that. And I'm pretty sure they will. Um, so again, we're going from a crew mission control dependent operations to crew vehicle habitat dependency. We're gonna be depending on the crew working with the vehicles, uh, autonomous systems, uh, the habitat systems on the surface, uh, you know, to help them uh, solve problems. Now, in the next slide is the Artemis program. And this is the first part. It's called the path uh, to the lunar surface. This is the first phase of the Artemis program. Uh, interesting enough, Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo. And that's one of the reasons they chose Artemis because the Apollo program uh, back in the 60, 60s uh, uh, was to go to the moon and now the, uh, the, the new one is Artemis. So first thing we're gonna do is have lunar reconnaissance, uh, continuing the surface exploration in terms of finding landing sites and, and, and uh, seeing where's the best place to, to look for minerals and water and things of that sort. As I mentioned previously, uh, the first uh, human space flight in, in the 21st century is gonna happen uh, hopefully next year, but not with you know, humans on board, just with the Orion spacecraft to check out its systems, especially when the Orion returns to Earth because it's coming back at a very high speed. And uh, it, of course, if you know your, uh, your, your physics, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, kinetic energy of, a, of something with a certain mass uh, is equal to one half mass times the velocity square. So the bigger the mass, uh, and, and going at a certain speed, the, the, um, the larger amount of kinetic energy that has to be bleeded off in order to uh, land correctly and appropriately and safely uh, on, uh, on Earth. And we have similar problems going to Mars, and I'll mention that later in my presentation. Um, Artemis II is going to be the first humans to orbit the moon in about 22 days, uh, hopefully uh, about, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 2025, uh, 2026. And then we start building what we call the, I guess uh, for lack of a better term, we call it the orbiting moon station. Uh, we're gonna have a uh, permanent presence orbiting around the uh, moon, just like we have space station uh, orbiting the earth. And this is gonna be the setting stage or the, uh, uh, the ground stage, if you will, of, um, of setting up a, uh, a per permanent orbiting platform around the moon. Uh, a few years later, we're going to have, and this is something I'm working on, is the humor lander system uh, that's going to uh, land humans on the moon and then bring them back up to the orbiting space station. And they can do that several times. Uh, uh, in the future, uh, they, once we get the human lander system operational up there and checked out, uh, we're going to have an uh, Artemis three mission that the Artemis and the human uh, lander system are docked together and the uh, lander system goes to the surface and, um, and, and performs, op you know, goes, performs operations. And then here's where the astronauts you know, do surface operations. Uh, but we're also gonna have other probes there probing around the South, uh, the South Pole. And then now uh, the path to sustainment, this is kind of like the second phase of the Artemis program. And in this case, now we have an international habitat uh, delivered to the gateway where we have uh, many different partners uh, working together uh, you know, to uh, provide the uh, resources uh, necessary to uh, explore the moon. Uh, so things like institute resource utilization, um, the um, Mars 2020 uh, is using uh, one, one experiment called MOXIE, which converts uh, carbon dioxide to oxygen. 
but at the very small scale. But you know, we're hoping to develop bigger in situ resource utilizations where we can take, uh, and I'm saying this in a simplistic fashion, uh, put moon moon dirt in, out comes water and uh, uh, fuel for for rockets. Uh, it's not that simple, but that's that's the intent. And then the first lunar uh, surface expedition uh, through Gateway, we're going to have a lot of robotics uh, going on on the surface, uh, so a lot of uh, extra vehicle activities uh, going on as well. And then we do sustainable operations uh, using re re uh, reusable landing systems. How reliable is the human landing system? Can we, you know, land land it and return it back to the Orion orbiting gateway? Uh, you know, several times, uh, and the we're going to be adding an airlock uh, for the gateway so that uh, the uh, uh, surface habitat uh, uh, people that are going to be going to the surface, uh, you know, can go in and out from the gateway uh, to the human lander system and and onto the Orion uh, as they do right now on station where they have uh, uh, SpaceX, they have the uh, Soyuz, and uh, it's attached to station and they can go in and out. Uh, as needed. In fact, they had to get in it uh, just a few days ago because I think the station was uh, on, a, uh, on a collision course with uh, orbiter debris and they had to put the astronauts in the, uh, in the escape modules of SpaceX and the Soyuz just in case they had to evacuate the, the space station. And then finally, enhanced human habitability capabilities, uh, you know, where this is going to start being the Mars dress rehearsal. A lot of the training that's going to be necessary to train the astronauts to uh, to go to Mars is going to be important. All during this time, we're going to be acquiring data, especially reliability data of things like the in situ resource utilization, uh, surface power, uh, fission surface power, nuclear power, um, uh, surface habitats. Okay, are the surface habitats big enough uh, to house the astronauts? Uh, can they house enough food, enough water, uh, personalized rovers, you know, uh, how well are they reliable uh, working in, in the uh, in the dust? And the moon dust is just horrible. Uh, in reading some of the stories from Apollo, uh, it was uh, it was just something that was very nasty and it caused a lot of problems in, in their hardware. In fact, uh, the uh, astronaut Gene Cernan, uh, Apollo 17 astronaut said, that the biggest challenge going to the moon is getting rid of that moon dust, and so uh, they're looking at ways of how to how to uh, rid that moon dust because you can get inside the uh, uh, the the the, the bearings, uh, mechanical bearings, a um, rover, and uh, basically uh, uh, degrade the the hardware. So it's a major challenge. Uh, in terms of reliability of systems uh, for uh, for the for this and determine what's going to work best so they can uh, not be so concerned with going to Mars and worried about the hardware not working properly. So uh, what we what do we have right now as far as current Mars explorations are concerned? Well, we have. Um, actually several different uh, uh, probes uh, that are out there. And you know, uh, several of them are related to uh, some of the technology that uh, we've accumulated over the years and used it to, uh, you know, to uh, create better robots. Like for example, the uh, Mars Science uh, Laboratory, okay? Uh, that was launched back in 2011. And it was to determine the planet's habitability uh, capability of, uh, of uh, keeping people alive and having the resources to keep people alive uh, there on Mars. Uh, Mars 2020 uh, that just launched in, uh, in August of 2020 is now there operating, is looking at ancient habitability. You know, what, what's the makeup of uh, Mars, you know, from an ancient standpoint, you know, at one time it had an atmosphere. Well, what's happened? What happened to it? One time it had water, what happened to it? Uh, and of course, uh, Mars, interesting enough, in you know, the orbits around the sun, is located on the outer portion of what they call the Goldilocks belt. Um, so the Goldilocks belt is between Venus and, and Mars. And of course, Earth is uh, right in the middle, <laughs> which is the just right. Um, there's a story here in the United States, and I'm not sure in India, that uh, it's uh, Goldilocks and the three bears. And uh, 
uh, it's this little girl that goes into the uh, home for, you know, these three bears, but, uh, you know, like for the first thing she encounters is uh, um, food, uh, but one food was too hot. And she says, this is too hot. And then this food uh, was too cold. Uh, and then this one, and then the, the one in the middle was just right. And that's why they call it the Goldilocks zone, uh, because Earth is right at the right portion of an orbit around the Earth, uh, rather the sun, uh, that provides or permits uh, uh, Earth to uh, be inhabited with uh, life, uh, obviously, as we know it. And then there's uh, Mars Odyssey, okay? So here's Mars Odyssey, uh, Odyssey and that was uh, to determine the planet composition, detect water, study radiation environments, and, and then there's the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, that one has been around a long time, and uh, since uh, and it's studying geology and the climate of Mars and future landing sites. And then most recently, Insight, and Insight um, is to uh, to look at the seismic uh, aspects of of Mars. You know, earthquakes and things of that sort. Incidentally, uh, Moon the, uh, has earthquake, uh, rather moonquakes. Uh, something to be concerned about when we land a surface habitat on, on the moon. Uh, and then, of course, uh, and I, I tuned in when, you, uh, when I heard the uh, distinguished scientists talk about uh, the, um, the uh, Mars uh, probe that India sent to space. And uh, that's uh, the Mars Orbiter mission, uh, Magellan. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about it much because uh, I think uh, the gentleman gave an excellent pre presentation about it. Uh, just to say that it's, uh, it, it's uh, quite an impressive feat. Interesting enough, the cost of this uh, spacecraft, and maybe the scientists said this, uh, was cheaper than the making the movie The Martian. <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, it was quite quite impressive uh, how uh, uh, how little money it took to to make such an impressive uh, uh, orbiting machine. Uh, it's, it was uh, inserted into Mars in, in 2014, and uh, obviously it's still operating there. It's a very uh, uh, the very uh, nature of this is to do a technology demonstration and to prove technology of designing, planning. Uh, and operations of interplanetary, inter, interplanetary missions. And, and I think this is gonna be certainly very beneficial for India uh, getting involved with, uh, you know, future space programs, especially human space flight uh, is, um, you know, understanding uh, what it takes to build uh, systems that go beyond Earth orbit, beyond the moon Earth orbit. And so, you know, the various uh, um, uh, sensors, you know, that are used, the photometer that's uh, used to, you know, to to examine why is the Earth's atmosphere, uh, rather than the Mars atmosphere, escaping um, methane to detect methane on Mars. Uh, you know, certainly as we may know that uh, methane is one way of determining life. You know, uh, uh, life forms give off methane, and so giving uh, looking for methane may be one way of determining whether life existed. Uh, the Martian exospheric uh, composite uh, explorer is to study the upper atmosphere. Uh, and then the Mar uh, Mars color camera is to, you know, do optical imaging of the surface. And then this one thermal imaging spectrometer is to, uh, again, look at meteorology and uh, uh, geologic features uh, of the Mars. All very impressive technology. And again, interesting enough, it, it was done on the first uh, exploration uh, mission uh, to Mars, <laughs> which is quite impressive because uh, the different countries that have tried to uh, uh, land or even orbit around Mars is only about a 50% uh, success rate, roughly. It's uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to uh, to get to Mars and, and land. As things get heavier, it gets even uh, more and more challenging. And I'll say a few words about that later. Uh, um, so what are the challenges? And let me just talk about first the human challenges. So the first one uh, in, uh, in uh, going into deep space is obviously the different uh, gravity uh, environments that we, uh, they will experience, whether they're in a spaceship uh, uh, experiencing microgravity uh, on the moon, which is one-tenth the Earth's gravity, and then Mars, which is like roughly one-third the Earth's gravity. And so all this uh, uh, causes problems for the human body. Uh, 
uh, there's balance disorders, you know, fluid shifts, you know, the, the, the uh, sinus, uh, if somebody has a, uh, sinus, a sinus drain, uh, if you have no gravity, the sinus will not drain. And so the, all that water fluids stay in the person's head. Uh, the body's uh, uh, muscular atrophy, in other words, it starts to expand and grow um, uh, as, they're, uh, if, as they are in the uh, gravity environment. Uh, people on shuttle as well as station have grown as much as two inches in height, uh, you know, being uh, in a weightless environment. And of course, bone loss, you know, the, the body doesn't experience the microgravity, or rather the, the 1G environment. And so, uh, you know, biologically, our, our bodies are, are, have been made to, uh, to produce uh, calcium, to, to produce strong bones, uh, to resist uh, the Earth's gravity. Well, if there's no gra gravity, the bones uh, say, hey, I don't have to produce uh, calcium. And so uh, there's a lot of bone loss. Space radiation, uh, a huge, uh, huge challenge, especially once we get outside of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field protects us uh, quite a bit uh, from high energy protons, uh, heavy ions, and things of that sort. Um, that's one of the reasons why space station can fly some commercial products on, on space station is because the radiation environment is not that severe. As we get away from the Earth's magnetic field and it no longer protects against those heavy uh, ions and heavy high energy protons, uh, it becomes becomes a problem for the for the uh, for the electronics isolation confinement. This is a big one. Uh, you know, you can have the best technology that'll survive and all this, but if the people cannot um, uh, learn to adapt to being away from Earth, it's going to be a major challenge. And of course, it's not only working in a team, uh, but also just feeling alone because you see Earth so far away. And of course, when you're far away from the Earth, you're far away from the sun. Well, the sun is actually beneficial for us because it helps produce uh, the right hormones, if you will, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for feeling good, if you will. Um, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but in the United States, up in Washington, the, uh, Washington State, which is on the upper west portion of the United States, uh, it rains a lot there and very little sun. Well, that area has a high rate of depression and, uh, and so it's obviously attributed to the lack of sun you know, that people get. Uh, where I live in Texas, <laughs> we get more than enough sun. So uh, uh, typically uh, that kind of depression is not uh, here uh, as, a, as a problem as it is up in Washington, uh, even in New York too as well. And then the other thing is the hostile environment. Okay, there, you know, obviously the, the moon and Mars, they're not uh, welcoming for uh, humans. And so we got to produce our own food. We got to produce our own oxygen. We got to produce our own water. We got to make sure that the habitats are very soundly designed uh, to protect the humans uh, from uh, from radiation, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, toxic uh, exposures that can happen. So uh, it's a it's a major challenge uh, for designing this technology. And then of course uh, medical. All right, we cannot have uh, at this point in time. We cannot have uh, uh, MRI machines and X-ray machines and all these fancy uh, machines that are available in hospitals uh, because uh, the electronics will not work in the radiation environment. So we got to design these systems that uh, will operate in the uh, in the space environment. Um, and, and then technology needs, oh gosh, there's a whole slew of them. And, and I'm not going to mention all of them, but I'm just going to give you a flavor of some. You know, certainly power is going to be a, a biggie. Uh, right now, Space Station generates about 75,000 watts of power uh, uh, in order to power the Space Station. And that's probably what we're going to need uh, for something like Mars and, 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 and the Moon. Well, uh, the solar panels are going to have to be huge uh, in order to generate that kind of power. And so maybe the alternative is nuclear power. So we're looking at nuclear power to generate that amount of, uh, uh, of uh, wattage uh, to support a, uh, a, a Mars mission. Um, you know, robotic systems, mining systems are, are gonna be important also as well, but they're gonna have to be reliable uh, in terms of not breaking down often because if they break down, it's, uh, it's very uh, risky to send astronauts 
to go do a repair. Uh, I can tell you that NASA does not like doing uh, extra vehicle activities because every time a uh, uh, astronaut goes out with in their spacesuit uh, into space, uh, they're 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 taking huge risk. Uh, there's a risk that something stops working on the on the uh, spacesuit. Uh, there are maybe a, a, a high energy uh, particle uh, hits the suit and, and puts a puncture to a hole and takes all the oxygen out. And of course, the radiation effects as well. Uh, robotic systems uh, are going to be have to be sophisticated uh, to do the work of the astronauts. But again, going back to the radiation effects, if we're going to have artificial intelligence on some of these systems, uh, they're going to have to be uh, uh, radiation hardened, if you will, in order to uh, li operate and survive in the deep space uh, beyond the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and of course, uh, the technology of crew interfaces. Uh, down here at the bottom, uh, you see the SpaceX uh, display control system, which I've been part of. And uh, you know that kind of technology, uh, as well as any kind of interfaces with the human, uh, are going to have to be highly reliable and to, uh, to avoid uh, what we call human error. And I'll say more about that later in my presentation. Habitats, I've mentioned, uh, they, they're going to have to be highly reliable technology systems with a lot of uh, perhaps built-in systems, including um, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning uh, and that kind of autonomous type systems. And of course, uh, communications is a huge problem. Uh, we're, we're far away from, from Mars, you know, up to 80 million miles away. And so uh, right now, the physics tells us that, you know, speed, uh, light can only travel so fast, right? Uh, or, or the communication signals. And, and so as we go further and further away from Earth, the, uh, the, uh, the delay in communications gets worse and worse. Um, and, and things about, you know, bandwidth, how much data can we send? You know, we'd love to send pictures, video of uh, the astronauts uh, talking to the family on the ground like we do here on Earth with an iPhone. Well, that's just not possible right now. Uh, we, we, we need to develop that kind of technology. And then this is a, the uh, landing systems that are heavy. So uh, I had an opportunity to talk to a, John, a JPL uh, engineer that was a, a the entry uh, EDL, entry, descent, and landing uh, uh, systems engineer. And so he was telling me that um, both Mars 2020 and the Mars Science Laboratory, they weigh about 2,000 pounds. Uh, about the about the weight of a small uh, automobile, and that's about the limit of weight for the way they land those kind of systems. Okay, uh, on on the Earth, again, it has to do with kinetic energy. As these uh, vehicles, like for example, the Habitat, is going to weigh somewhere in the vicinity. I've I've seen anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand pounds. Uh, it's going to be hard to land something that big on Mars uh, because you got to bleed off a lot of that kinetic energy uh, in order to slow it down and go into the uh, very thin Earth, uh, Earth, very thin Mars atmosphere. So that's a major challenge in, in technology development too. How do we get a very large uh, uh, object uh, to land on Mars safely that's coming in at you know, 35, 40,000 miles per hour? Uh, and then, you know, the medical equipment, again, uh, converting medical equipment to something that's, uh, that's suitable for deep space uh, is a major challenge. Uh, that's a, a prototype uh, in situ resource utilization station. Uh, and again, that's to produce water because we cannot take uh, a water for a three-year mission for four astronauts. Uh, it, that would be a lot of weight. Uh, you know, one, pound, uh, one gallon of water uh, uh, weighs uh, about eight pounds. So again, a major challenge uh, and also to make it very reliable where it doesn't break down. You, you don't want it to be breaking down. Um, I have a friend that has a farm and uh, he has a water well that uh, you know, he grabs, he gets water from, uh, but sometimes the well uh, pump breaks and he's got to go fix it. Uh, just about <laughs> every two or three months, he's got to fix that uh, well pump. So you don't want to be doing that, especially in a harsh environment. Um, so uh, we got to watch out for errors and failures. And what you're seeing here is some of the errors and failures that NASA looks at when we're developing systems. The hardware 
uh, you know, there's something called the bathtub curve and hard work and fail after a, a, at the very beginning of a, a, of a hardware development when it's young, but if it passes a certain point in time, it now becomes a constant failure uh, of, the, of the hardware. And we can predict things like maintenance. We can predict when it's gonna fail. As it gets older, it starts to wear out, whether it's electrical, electrical or mechanical. Now, contrast that with software. Software does not have the same kind of failure rate. Software, because uh, you write code, you may have, you write a bunch of code and you have a lot of errors and then you try to find all the errors in the software and then it goes down to a certain minimal failure rate. But if you're gonna upgrade it, it uh, you have more errors and then you 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 know you, uh, you find those errors and then bring it down and then you upgrade again. And then until you stop upgrading the software, do you get a constant failure rate? So it's a different way of dealing with failure rates of, uh, of, uh, of software. And if we're talking about machine learning and, and if the algorithms are changing, how do we know it's gonna be reliable or not? How do we verify that that system is gonna be uh, reliable after let's say it did a machine learning uh, uh, algorithm change uh, and, and we, we just don't know yet you know, how, to, how to test for that, at least not at this point. And then the human part, the human error, uh, you can have the best machines in the world, uh, the most uh, best designs, but if the human doesn't know how to operate it or the human is not feeling well, uh, he or she can make mistakes. I, I can tell you that that was one of the things that I learned uh, uh, over the years. Uh, I, uh, as an engineering student, I was taught to, you know, build bit, you know, good hardware, good software, but they never talked about the human. Okay, never talked about, you know, the the human in terms of slip of actions. You know, your cognitive memory, uh, your ability to uh, comprehend uh, complex. Uh, uh, situations. There's something called situational awareness, where situational awareness is uh, something ha happening in your environment, and then you're trying to absorb what's happening, and you're trying to figure out what do you need to do next. And those three steps sometimes causes a lot of confusion, depending on the complexity of the machine, that it could cause a human to punch the wrong button. And, 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 and cause an explosion or whatever. So that's why we test we test and we test. Uh, that's why it gets like, very expensive, especially in human spaceflight, uh, when we, we get to the test phase, uh, is because we just test a lot, especially when we've uh, developed the systems, we tested the systems, and then we put those systems against the human, and the human is testing the systems and seeing if there's, there's any human error. Uh, it's a major undertaking. Uh, and of course, you know, we do this through the systems engineering process, uh, you probably are aware of that, uh, but basically in the systems uh, engineering process, it's uh, basically a methodical way of developing systems. It's very similar to how scientists uh, you know, do uh, scientific uh, development uh, uh, using the scientific method, you know, make observations, form a hypothesis, design an experiment, uh, capture the data, compare the data against the, ex uh, the experiment, and look at it against a hypothesis. And so when we're doing all this um, project uh, implementation, definition, testing, and all that, we're also doing the uh, human error aspect. Down here at the bottom, you see the hazard that can happen. Each one of this is called a barrier. In other words, something that can prevent an error from happening. And of course, we got, you know, we, we want to make sure we got all the requirements correct. We want to make sure that the design is very good that we, we check the system over and over again against safety. Uh, we've trained, we train the astronauts and, and, and train for every possible uh, um, event that can happen. Maintenance, making sure everything is uh, working properly. And then the crew health. Everything should pretty much prevent a hazard from going through. And that's what you're seeing here. Sometimes a hazard being deflected by a barrier. But then none of this is perfect. There's, that's what these holes are. It's a weakness in the barrier. And there's, it, there'll be that one day where things line up perfectly and the holes line up perfectly that a hazard like punching the, the wrong switch will go right through the requirements. We forgot to, 
you know, factor this into the switch. Uh, we forgot to design this safety feature on the switch. We didn't, we didn't check the safety of that switch. Uh, we forgot to train uh, for this situation in a switch closure. Uh, we, we, we didn't maintain the switch properly. Uh, and then the crew uh, just punched the wrong switch. And that's where the accident happens. And those are the things that we have to be watching out for as we're doing all this uh, uh, systems engineering and human systems integration. Um, and of course, human systems integration is just uh, looking at the human element capabilities and limitations as we develop in these systems. Uh, much more complicated than just working with a robot. <laughs> uh, you know, if a, a, a robot is very deterministic, uh, again, humans are not. And then um, a few words of advice uh, for, for students out there. Uh, that I'd like to share with you is that uh, for me, family heritage is a motivation to do better. I did not come from a very well-to-do family. I, I came from the ghettos of uh, uh, a town of Corpus Christi, Texas. And uh, I never thought I would be working at NASA, uh, to be honest with you. My grades weren't all that fantastic. Uh, and so grades don't make that person. Determination, hard work does. I worked very hard, uh, you know, to, uh, to try to, uh, do the best I could in school, but realizing that I could not be a uh, you know perfect A student, I, I went to go work in, in areas that were related to electronics and engineering. And that experience actually helped me get my job at NASA, the experience. Um, and you're gonna make mistakes and you're gonna make a lot of them. And, but it's important to learn from those mistakes. And I can't tell you how many I've made, NASA's made many, you know, we've got some very uh, high caliber engineers and scientists, but even, you know, they make mistakes and, and, and that's okay. It's just to learn from those mistakes and you only fail when you stop trying. I keep, you know, I hate to hear when students say, well, I failed. Um, I failed an exam. Well, yeah, I, you failed the exam. I failed many exams <laughs> too, but I didn't stop trying. I, I kept, you know, I, I went back and then you know, for the next exam, I did better. So um, it's not failure, uh, it's, a, it's a setback. You, you, you suffer a setback and not a failure until you stop trying. And then recognize that everyone's important. This is the soft skill. This is the humility, the, the uh, compassion, if you will, of working with people in the project. Uh, I can tell you that uh, just knowing the janitor and giving them uh, uh, a gift uh, during the holidays uh, makes a big difference. Uh, I, there's, there's a lot of stories I can share about, you know, uh, uh, being a good person. And, and I can tell you that if you're a project leader and you show compassion and, you know, you're, you're kind and, you know, you help your, your, your team, your team is going to do everything possible to make that project a success. Uh, and of course, you know, you, there's some projects that have been successful, uh, but I can tell you one, and I'm not going to mention the name of it. It was successful, but the manager, the project manager was a, was a tyrant. He, you know, he was uh, very rude, very uh, hard on people. And once the project was over with, they all left. They all left the project. Nobody wanted to work with them anymore. So yeah, you can be successful uh, by being rude and tyrant and, you know, being uh, very bossy and all that, uh, but you're not gonna have a good following. Um, the only challenge you face are the ones that you put in yourself. Uh, and I found that out to be so true. Uh, and so, um, you know, one day we're going to live and work on other worlds, uh, going to Mars, especially. That's the major challenge, and I'm, I'm sure India is going to be part of it. Uh, we're going to be settling other worlds. Uh, Mars will be the first one, and then from there, hopefully, we'll, we'll go on to other planets and other solar systems. And then uh, uh, from there, uh, we, who knows what, what lies uh, ahead. So uh, with that, uh, that uh, concludes my presentation. And I'm going to stop sharing and return control to you all. Thank you, George. Thank you. It's a great uh, learning from your side. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very, uh, very enthusiastic uh, lecture, sir, about NASA, about ISRO. And thanks for precious time also. Sir, may we, may we take some uh, questions from students, sir? Would you like to talk to them? George, sir, would you like to like to answer some questions of uh, some students, sir? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, students, uh, George, sir, will uh, give you some uh, your question answer. So please raise your hand. 
पाटिल सर प्लीज एसिस्ट एज एडमिन सर बी शॉर्ट विथ योर क्वेश्चन ऋषि प्लीज आस्क ऋषि अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ एंड प्लीज आस्क ऋषि मनीष कुमार त्रिपाठी हेलो यस यस यू आर ऑडिबल प्लीज आस्क गुड इवनिंग सर good evening to everyone so my question is that uh, first of all because uh, when i know is about the first, uh, because we using the sixth nation as a using the cryogenic engine first of all so my question is regarding this uh, what type of currently engines and uh, which are used in present time of scenario of the rocket to launch the vehicles just like uh, in a ps will be for used for launch uh, in a just like a mangalyaan but we are discussing about that what types of engine is suitable for in next generation so that we can be uh, it's uh, easily for us so my question is regarding this to what types of engine basically used in futures because the cryogenic engines currently scenario is used so what types of uh, engines used used preferred to to be settle in the satellite for the rockets that's my question sir so uh, your your question is related to engine what kind of engine Uh okay so I'm not a uh, <laughs> I'm not a propulsion guy um but you know the engines that they're using on space launch uh, on the space uh, space launch system which is the biggest rocket ever built is using uh five of the uh I think it's the R uh 25 uh engines that were used on shuttle uh because of the the amount of uh, of uh, impulse force that they have uh but they're liquid fuel and and of course liquid fuel is uh, something that we want uh, because you can shut it off and turn it on as opposed to a uh, solid rocket uh, uh though space launch system is also going to use solid rockets because the uh the the combined uh, uh lifting force with the solid rockets and the liquid liquid engines are is going to be enough to to lift this large large vehicle you know getting 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 away from uh earth's gravity is the major challenge you know it and that's why we're looking at options building a spacecraft on orbiting the moon uh, we call it the mars uh, transport we're going to build where the, the plan is to build it uh, orbiting the moon and then launch it from there so that way you don't have to have a lot of uh, uh, engine power if you will uh, you know to get away from the gravity effect so uh, um but Yeah, I, the whole area of rocket engine is being explored. Uh there's a gen- gentleman here at uh in Houston by the name of Sonny White, Dr. Sonny White, and uh he's looking at uh different kinds of engine uh technology, you know, to be used uh, uh for going into deep space. You know, one of them uh, and, and of course it's uh, from Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, uh the is a Vasimir engine, which is a plasma rocket too as well. but it takes a lot of energy to make these uh, uh you know plasma rockets so uh uh it's a uh, work that's still going on uh but we're still we're still with chemical rockets right now and we probably will be for a long period of time uh next uh, yatharth chopra ask your question yeah, yeah. Hey George, uh, this is Yathar Chopra from Mumbai. Uh, just wanted to ask, what's your take on uh, private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin taking their uh, steps towards the uh, developing of space technology? I'm sorry, you you're kind of breaking up a little bit. Yeah, my question was, uh, what's your take on private companies like uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin uh, taking steps to develop the space technology? Uh, the uh, commercial uh, com- commercial c- companies you're talking about like private spacex companies. private companies like spacex and blue origin okay your your audio is coming in or maybe it's on my side can you type the message real quick yes sure. uh next uh, uh, sir we are taking from sanu bharma from chandigarh Sanu Verma, please ask your question. Sir, I wanted to ask. It's not related to some like spacecraft or something. I wanted to ask that 
if uh, somehow something can uh, travel like faster than the speed of light is it possible to um, time travel and also uh, will it help to uh, travel the light years faster or oh, if we go faster than the speed of light we can do time travel yes sir yes sir you want to know whether it is possible or not uh, well, uh, not with humans. <laughs> we, 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 we gotta get, we, 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 uh, it, it's a, it's a major challenge. Of course, Einstein's equation says, as you approach the speed of light, your mass becomes infinite. And so, uh, you don't want people getting very, very, very big. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's a, it's a major challenge, but you know, we're going to have to look for different ways of, uh, traveling, uh, in the solar system and in space because space is so huge. Uh, you know, it took Voyager, Voyager 2, almost 44 years to get out of our solar system, traveling at about 38,000 miles an hour. So we're going to have to find a way to go faster um, than, uh, than, than we can right now. So uh, that's a major challenge. Uh, next, uh, we are going to Aradhya Tati. Aradhya, unmute yourself. Yes. yes. And uh, sir, I am in port and uh, can you please uh, tell me the road way to uh, be a scientist for me? I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite capture the question. Sir, uh, sir, uh, sir, he want to be scientist. Please advise him how uh, he uh, go through his career. Oh, if you want to be a scientist, what does it take? Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, becoming a scientist or, or, or an engineer in, involves, you know, uh, learning a lot about STEM, you know, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Mathematics is obviously a, a very uh, key point of, of learning the mathematics. Uh, uh, the mathematics teach you, teach, uh, to me, it teaches you a very, uh, very thought provoking way of solving problems. And so, uh, and that's what it takes to be a scientist and engineer. So, you know, stay in school, take as much math and science as you can and do some experiments, you know, just do some experiments on your own and, and, and you know, learn, you know, things like, for example, uh, why, why, why does a, a bowling ball that weighs eight pounds and a piece of paper that weighs uh, one ounce, if you drop them, they, they hit the ground at the same time. You know, that's a why question. Asking questions also is very important um i can tell you that that's one, one thing that i can you know hit myself in the head for is that when i was growing up i didn't ask enough, a lot of questions and uh it turns out that's important for learning so um you know uh, staying obviously staying in school so uh stay in school learn as much math and science as you can and ask questions ask questions ask questions ask questions sir uh, our one uh student who uh, uh, he written the question in chat box as you guided sir sir he want to know uh, what is your opinion about the pacex and uh, blue origin like uh, private companies uh, initiative in development of space technology sir yeah uh, so that's a good question uh, and as i mentioned i i work with spacex and uh, I'm, I'm going to be working with uh, a couple other co commercial companies. So this is uh, this is my observation that commercial companies are uh, in the business of making money, and so it's important for them uh, to uh, uh, to make a profit, right? Because they have to satisfy people that invest money in their company, and so they take a lot of pain and effort in 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 researching what's the best way, cost effective wise of developing technology for space exploration. And I think they've done a very good job for, you know, SpaceX right now. Um, uh, like the, like the, for example, the display screens that, that I showed you, uh, touch screens, okay? It's the first touch screens ever used in space uh, for controlling a spacecraft. Uh, that, that took a lot of effort, uh, but they've, they've done it. So I think uh, commercial sector uh, brings in a lot of, uh, uh, let's call it uh, development, different ways of developing systems uh, that uh, may not be as expensive as we do, as we used to do it in the old days, if you will. So uh, uh, it's, it's very nice to have a 
the uh, uh, commercial companies uh, helping in space exploration because they, they bring in a different, fresh, new way of, uh, of uh, helping systems. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Dharja Rakesh Jain, ask your question. Good evening, sir. My name is Daria and I'm from Mumbai and I also study in fifth standard. And I like to know that is there any engine, rocket engine bigger than the Titan engine and what are the uses of the ion engine? Uh, you're talking about ion engines? Yes, sir. Yeah, they, they've used ion engines, but uh, I can tell you that uh, for human spaceflight, <laughs> They're just not powerful enough uh, because of uh, you know how big and massive the uh, the uh, objects that we want to fly to other planets uh, are going to be. Uh, the ion engine would have to be very large or, or produce a lot of uh, obviously ions, you know, for producing the thrust. And so uh, Dawn, I think uh, it was the uh, spacecraft that used uh, ion engines, but it's very small and mass-wise, it was not very massive. But if you're trying to launch, uh, a, uh, uh, like for example, a big habitat that weighs, you know, more than a big house, uh, it, ion engine is just not going to cut it. You know, we uh, unless they, you know, we find a better way of, of doing uh, uh, high-powered uh, high ion engines. But it takes a lot of, uh, you know, energy to produce one. So it, it's it's a trade. It's a it's a challenge. It's a major challenge. Uh, what kind of technology? do we need uh, for uh, deep space for sending large objects uh, to other planets uh, it you know we we have to stop thinking about little satellites you know that we're accustomed to uh, we have to start thinking about you know big big things that you know that we have to take to other planets and uh, uh, it's like I said uh, right now the um, uh, Mars 2020 uh, uh, robot that weighs about 2,000 pounds. It's the biggest thing right now that we can land on Mars um, with the current technology, uh, just simply because it's, uh, uh, as you get heavier, bigger mass, the velocity times the mass, kinetic energy, you got to bleed off that kinetic energy and it's not a simple problem. Perhaps you'll, you'll develop that kind of technology. <laughs> Uh, next, Rishi Magnani, ask your question. Good evening, sir. Sir, I, I was having doubt on Einstein's equation. If a particle travels at the speed of light, its mass would become infinite. But, sir, according to Newton, mass is absolute quantity. So, sir, either Einstein is wrong or either Newton is wrong. So, can you clarify that? Uh, I'm sorry, what's, um, I think quite, kept, I, I, you're talking about Einstein's equation for, uh, for what, for the speed of light? Sir, um, if a particle, if a particle travels at a speed of light, its mass would become infinite. But sir, according to Newton, mass is an absolute quantity. So sir, either Einstein is wrong or either Newton is wrong. So can you clarify? <laughs> well, okay, so. <laughs> Uh, so this is a debate between Newton and Einstein, huh? <laughs> so Newton, uh, sorry, I said Newton uh, was in the macro world, the big world, right? Uh, because he, he didn't understand uh, quantum mechanics and all that. Whereas Einstein looked at it from a more uh, small particle standpoint, uh, what we call the micro world, right? So you got the micro world, small particles that, you know, the mass is very, very small. And then you got the macro world where you got something like an automobile, right? Big car uh, traveling at a certain speed. So uh, the laws, uh, you know, they, they um, apply for, for those different uh, operations, but you cannot say, I'm going to put a car and have it travel the speed of light. That's going to be hard, okay? Um, but a particle, you can't because of the mass, right? It's very tiny. So uh, you can accelerate this particle. And that's why they have particle accelerators, right? Uh, like CERN in uh, Switzerland, I think it is. And they can accelerate these particles uh, near the speed of light and then collide two small particles and then see what the after effects are. But uh, uh, I, I think 
Sir Isaac Newton did a very good job because we still use Sir Isaac Newton and his laws, especially, and then also Kepler's laws uh, for guiding uh, spacecrafts uh, right now. So uh, you got the, mi the macro world and then you got the little micro world, but they both, they both are needed. Uh, Animish Hegre from Karnataka, India. Ask your question to sir. Yes, sir. Sir George, sir, sir, you told the you obviously told us about the challenges and problems faced while uh, uh, going to Mars. But uh, I would like to ask that: uh, Can we like uh, go to Mars and make it like Earth? Like, uh, could we stay there in this century? Could we achieve that? Or is it possible to do that? You, you, turn, you mean turn Mars like Earth? Like, yeah, like it had an atmosphere it, uh, before, yeah. right? Uh, you talk, you're talking about uh, terraforming, terraforming Mars into Earth. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of discussions about that, but oh man, it, it, it's, it, it's a major, major scientific and engineering undertaking. Um, Maybe one day they will, you know, maybe they just launch a rocket with a certain, you know, something inside of it and it, it turns it all green and, and water and all that. But, you know, uh, the last uh, uh, conference that I attended, they, they talked about that and, you know, they were talking about with existing technology, it, it would take over a thousand years. So um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not doable right now. One day it will be a hope. Good question though. Uh, next, uh, Pranshu Joshi from Chandigarh. You are not audible. Uh, Get a lot of feedback. Yeah, yeah. Unmute yourself. Uh. So my question is that there are already two to three rovers on Mars that are collecting soil samples from it. So, sir, if we have to research on it to find out what type of microorganism are, are growing on it, or is were there any microorganism present there, we need them on Earth uh, for the research. So, sir, is there any way to take them back on Earth from Mars? And so my second question is that, uh, as Jan Joshi sir stated, that we need more than $10,000 to lift off one kg mass to space. Can't we make a tether cable from Earth to uh, ISS or space, uh, which is made from graphene or some type of strong material uh, so that we could reduce the cost drastically? Um, okay, so you have two questions. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So what was your first question again? I, I think you had two questions and I was yes. trying to think so about it. So my first question was that there are already two to three NASA rovers that are collecting soil samples from its surface to find out whether there are any microorganisms present in it, whether it was suitable for life or not. But for such extensive research, we also need that soil sample on Earth. So is there any type of process or any type of uh, system made so that it could be transferred back to the labs in Earth and be researched on it. Uh, for for Mars, you said for Mars. Yes, sir. Okay, so you know this uh, Mars twenty twenty uh, actually gathered samples and uh, it's stored in the container, and then the, there's going to be a follow on mission where it's going to return it back to Earth. Uh, and then they're going to bring it, actually, they're going to bring it here to the Johnson Space Center uh, because we have a, a materials a laboratory uh, that did a, actually a lot of work for Apollo uh, during the moon program. Uh, and then they're going to look at, you know, some of the, uh, uh, you know, the makeup composition of this, uh, of this dirt. But, you know, here's the thing is that, you know, we, we don't know if there's, if the microorganisms uh, uh, traveled further down deep into the Mars surface as water became less and less on the surface. And so uh, we need to, you know, look at it from different perspectives. And it, it's, it's a challenge, it's a challenge. Uh, 
but uh, I think one day we'll 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 uh, we'll we'll find out, you know, uh, what exactly happened to Mars. And it's important because um, Mars uh, may be what Earth uh, Mars was what Earth was uh, at one time, and so Earth may be on a path like Mars. And so we need to find that out. You know, why does it lose that? its atmosphere, uh, why does the water go away, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, eventually it will. When the sun dies, <laughs> when the sun dies, uh, it's going to, um, you know, it's going to change the earth dramatically. And uh, obviously, uh, hopefully by that time, we've learned to, uh, to leave earth and go, go live somewhere else. Uh, I'm actually running out of time because I'm getting ready to go to a meeting. So uh, I, I think I'll take one more question. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Sir, uh, I would like to ask our Paramjit Singh, sir, to ask some question to him. Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. This is the last question due to, due to time we are not taking. If um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, it, uh, another time, uh, George, sir, uh, with us, uh, he gives another appointment, we will surely uh, take uh, more questions, more discussions, surely. This is the last question from our side, Paramjit Singh, sir, from Chandigarh. Sir, unmute yourself, sir. My, my audio? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, George, sir, and welcome to uh, this webinar once again. And this is, a, this is a great opportunity for all of us to interact with you and uh, Mainly our students will be inspired. So there are six students from my institute also participating in this webinar. So this is great um, uh, evening for all of us. And uh, really we are inspired from your our deliberations and presentation. And just I have one uh, idea in my mind. Uh, as we know, tardy grade in an organism uh, on earth in polar regions of India or any um, about globe, can we inspire from tardigrade uh, pro, uh, qualities which tardigrade has? It can survive everywhere in the uh, universe. So can we uh, inspire from tardigrade to develop some technologies such the, so that uh, one day space tourism also become possible without uh, any hassle or any risk? So this is my question, sir. And thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So space tourism, uh, that's, that's a topic that's uh, obviously commercially, a lot of companies are, are looking at. And you know, one day, uh, again, because uh, commercial companies are in the business of making money, uh, they, they don't want any lawsuits. So they don't want, <laughs> they don't want people to die on their, on their spaceships and they don't want them to die in their hotels. And so they're going to make these uh, uh, um, uh, space tourism uh, more safe. And, and, and just like the airline industry, if you look at uh, airlines when they first started in 19, you know, 19, uh, early 1900s, 1920, there were a lot of crashes, plane crashes. And then every time, unfortunately, again, you learn from mistakes, right? And you learn to build on that. Um, and, and now uh, airplane travel is, is more safe than uh, traveling in the in the roads of uh, of Houston, <laughs> uh, where you know, you're you're likely to have an accident on, on the road, but uh, airplanes rarely have uh, accidents now. Same thing with tourism; uh, it's going to get better and better. And you know, one day I'm hoping that it gets cheap enough that we can all afford it. Right now, it's too expensive, uh, but uh, hopefully one day it'll be cheap that we can all go and. Uh, and, and enjoy being out in space. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us for a long time. Uh, we are, um, it's our right to join us. Now uh, it's time, uh, sir, uh, our chairman, sir, is traveling, but he was uh, interested to thank you. Uh, Dr. Chandramuli Joshi, sir, he is tra in traveling in train. Uh, he's uh, traveling from uh, Mumbai to uh, Ahmedabad, Goa. Uh, Gujarat. Uh, sir, uh, please uh, say something, sir. George, sir, is uh, with us. Hello. Sir, sir, uh, sir, very interesting and very e effective uh, lecture. 
we inspired the, your lecture and congratulations behalf for our all institute very nice and interesting and effective and motivation lecture congratulations Thank sir you. behalf of our all institute of the raman science technology foundation and other institute huh? Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Sir, time to time, we are organizing so many offline programs at various prestigious places. Uh, this time, we have also started our uh, 75 schools journey within the 82 days. It's a, uh, throughout the India, uh, throughout the 28 states of India, uh, due to celebrate the 75th Independence Day. And that was started from Gujarat. Uh, Somnath Temple, very prestigious, very famous temple. So in such a um, offline program, uh, we hope you can join, sir, in next time we will send some invitation through our, through our uh, chairman, sir, uh, formally. And we hope you visit our India and uh, in a grand successful ceremonies uh, and we can get your blessings at that moment also, sir. So it's an invitation from India uh, in this occasion also. Uh, sir, please um, uh, um, no, take a note in your diary as early as possible. It, you please come and join us uh, in offline mode also. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, All right. At the last, no, no. At the last All right. uh, time, yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. And, um, uh, again, thank you for having me and thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, our, I will certainly consider it uh, uh, for the invitation. So uh, uh, we'll keep in touch. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. And another okay. invitation, sir. This program award ceremony we are conducting on 30th December, which is a uh, death anniversary and anniversary day of uh, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. We'll uh, confer the award to almost 10 students, best uh, qualified students as a India International Sarabhai Student Scientist Award. And uh, like the yesterday year, uh, so we are inviting once again to join this session also, uh, even possible offline, even possible online. Sir, we need your support also. Sir, your acknowledgement is there. Thank you, sir. And now it's the time. Right. Thank you, sir. And then now it's a time of vote of thanks. Uh, I would like to invite our national secretary Sandeep Patil ji from uh, Maharashtra uh, to. Um, Close this session with his uh, vote of thanks. Sandeep Patil ji. Patil sir. Yes, Patil sir. Ah, yes, sir. Yes. Manik yes, sir. sir. Your session, sir. Vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Banik sir. Uh, in this program, we have the great uh, chairman and great son, Dr. Chandramurthy Joshi sir, who is traveling from Maharashtra to Rajkot, and then he has been traveling with us at a moment. So, I thank him very much for his support. इसे क्या साथ चीफ गेस्ट के तौर पर स्पीकर के तौर पर हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए थे नासा से जॉर्ज सैलाजर सर जिन्होंने बहुत बढ़िया तरीके से पीपीटी के जरिए हमें सभी बातें बताई और बहुत बढ़िया तरीके से एक्शन भी किया तो अपने आप में भी बहुत बड़ी बात है कि बच्चों के मन में बहुत से क्वेश्चंस रहते और उनका सरलता से उन्होंने जवाब दिया तो मैं उनका भी बहुत-बहुत शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ। Thank you very much, Jawar Salajar sir, who joined to us. Thank you sir, thank you very much. Also, हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए थे हमारे Dr. Jayant Joshi sir, जो कि scientist है इसरो से और 40 साल से ज़्यादा वक्त उनका इसरो में रहा है। तो it is a ex scientist, वो भी हमारे साथ जुड़े और उन्हें भी अपना कीमती समय देते हुए यहाँ पर हमें बहुत सी बात स्पेस के बारे में बताई तो उनका भी मैं बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया अदा करता हूं इसी के साथ हमारे साथ और भी हमारे बहुत से टिप गेस जुड़े हुए थे जैसे कि आदरणीय प्रलाद रामराव सर हमसे जुड़े हुए थे और उन्होंने भी हमारे साथ इंटरेक्शन किया 
तो अपना और अपना कीमती वक्त हमारे लिए निकाला थैंक यू सर थैंक यू वेरी मच टू ज्वाइन टू अस इसी के साथ हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए थे हमारे सभी जोन डायरेक्टर्स हमारे आईटी डायरेक्टर्स स्टेट डायरेक्टर्स परमजीत सिंह सर आईटी डायरेक्टर्स एनसीटीएस हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए वीना डिंगरा मैम जो नेशनल सेक्रेटरी एपीजे अब्दुल कलाम नेशनल काउंसिल ऑफ यंग साइंटिस्ट हमारे दूसरे जोन डायरेक्टर्स वसुदेव कमलिया सर भी हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए और साउथ जोन से हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए हमारे कुलदीप गुप्ता सर जम्मू कश्मीर से जोन डायरेक्टर तो उनका भी मैं बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ थैंक यू टू ऑल और द टीचर्स हमारे साथ इस प्रोग्राम में जुड़े हुए और जो बच्चे बच्चों के लिए तो मैं क्या कहूँ बहुत मैं यहाँ पे नहीं था लेकिन ऑनलाइन के माध्यम से मैं थोड़ा सा देख रहा था मैं बाहर था लेकिन बहुत बढ़िया तरीके का इंटरेक्शन आज हुआ है और मैं कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन देना चाहता हूँ हमारे नेशनल ज्वाइंट सेक्रेटरी अंजन बनिक सर को कि इतना इनोवेटिव प्रोग्राम आपने इस माध्यम से रखा और एक बहुत बढ़िया तरीके का इंटरेक्शन इस माध्यम से हुआ तो मैं बच्चों का भी जो बच्चे यहाँ पे जुड़े हुए चिल्ड्रन साइंटिस्ट जुड़े हुए उनका भी मैं बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ और सभी को शुभ रात्रि थैंक यू टू ऑल थैंक यू वेरी मच ओवर टू अंजन बनिक सर थैंक यू सर आप सबको हार्दिक शुभकामनाएं थैंक्स फॉर ज्वाइनिंग इन सच वे वी इफ वी कैन एबल टू इंस्पायर ऑल ऑफ यू स्पेशली स्टूडेंट्स एंड इफ इट इज पॉसिबल टू पेनिट्रेट द मैसेज टू थ्रू द टीचर्स टू द स्टूडेंट्स ऑल्सो इट विल बी ग्रेट सक्सेस फॉर सच इवेंट्स थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग आवर सेकेंड राउंड and the last phase of conferring the award will be conducted uh, soon the last phase of the uh, conferring the award will be uh, scheduled on 30 december which is the anniversary of dr vikram sarabhai so rest uh, you will be intimated and we have kept all of you uh, your uh, email we will send uh, at, at the at the earliest we will send the certificate of participation to you uh, as far it is possible uh, at the earliest so thank you and once again good night